we are going to talk about winning the Christian war. And Paul pictures Christians as being at war with the ways of the world. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not worldly weapons. They are spiritual, they're mighty in God. 1 Timothy 1, 18. So, son Timothy, that by them you may wage the good warfare. There's a battle, there's a spiritual battle going on in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. Paul saw Christians as good soldiers for Christ. And, and in their day, 2,000 years ago, you couldn't go to the marketplace without seeing a whole bunch of soldiers. And they had their helmets on, and they had their breastplates on, and they had their swords hanging from their sides. And that's why Paul could use that language in the scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.3 you therefore must endure hardship. Everybody has hardship one way or another. As a good soldier for Christ. Verse 4. No one is engaged in warfare, entangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him, Jesus, who enlisted him as a soldier. And we probably ought to say when we baptize people, you are being enlisted as a soldier for Christ. It's like, ooh. Maybe we should mention that in the pre-baptismal counseling. Philippians, um, no, Philemon, 1-2. Uh, to the beloved um, Archippus, our fellow soldier, right? So it, this was on Paul's mind a lot. Satan intensif intensifies his attacks against the saints in the latter days. I'm convinced we're in the end times based on Daniel 40 verse, Daniel 11 verse 40. But you don't have to be. But a lot of people are already feeling, feeling we're in the end times, right? Revelation 11, 7. It said, when they finish their testimonies, the two witnesses, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, that's Satan, will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And up until this time, God has prevented them from being killed by everybody who wants to kill them, right? By fire coming down. And, and killing those, and, and when it gets to the end of the three and a half years of their witness, God says, okay, you can kill them now so their bodies can lay in the street for three and a half days, because those three and a half days are going to be like, <laughs> right? Because everybody's excited to see their dead bodies, and then when the voice from heaven says, come up here, and they sit up and they stretch, you know, oh, anybody got any coffee? <laughs> And then they float up into the sky, and you can bet there'll be cameras rolling, and people have got cell phones. There'll be cell phones rolling, and it'll be all over. Oh no, they're alive again! Horrors, right? Revelation thirteen seven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. God makes available everything we need to be victorious soldiers for Christ. First Corinthians fifteen fifty seven. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Christ. There's probably some hymns in the hymnal about that, right? Paul describes what our victory looks like in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible, oh, that's how it feels in the morning. I, I got up and I was making coffee and I thought, I don't have my glasses on. What am I doing, right? <laughs> Fortunately, nothing bad happened. <laughs> and then after a cup of coffee, I went looking for my glasses. Right? This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And it's just a word. But you stop and think about it. Boy, that's a nice word. That means you're never going to die again. It also means you're never going to feel old again. You will be old, but you will never feel old. You will feel young. You will feel energized because you'll have a spirit being body. Um, then she'll be brought to pass, and I think this was mentioned, what is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. <sighs> what a victory. Jesus is now Father, our planning, and awesome victory celebration for us. Right? I watched Macy's thing, you know, right? I, I recorded it, went to bed. <laughs> and the next morning I, I played it while I was doing something else. Boom, 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 boom. You know, fantastic. Yeah, great. Anyhow. God has a celebration plan for those who gain the victory over Satan's false religious teachings that are coming to our planet Earth. It's a little weird now. Politics is getting religious. It's like, you have to have faith in what I'm telling you, even if it's a lie. <laughs> right, yeah. Jesus interrupts himself to show us 
the future victory celebration. It's not often Jesus interrupts himself, so let's look for this. Jesus is about to explain the seven last plagues of God's wrath in Revelation when he interrupts the message by describing the awesome victory celebration. Revelation 15.1, right? John is writing it down. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, and in them the wrath of God is complete. The next verse is where Jesus interrupts himself. And I saw something like a sea of glass. Wait a minute. We were going to talk about the seven last plagues. How did we skip over to a sea of glass? What's going on here, right? Mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beasts, his image, his mark, over the number of his name, making it pretty clear that any one of these is bad, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. How many of you can play a harp? Anybody here? No harpists here. Don't worry. When you get there, it'll be a spiritual harp. You will be a spiritual being, and you will have guidance on how to play your spiritual harp. It doesn't sound good. Jesus continues with the seven last plagues in verse 6, but first he gives three the victory celebration verses. Verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses. I hope you've got that memorized. And the, ser the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. You need to memorize that too. Maybe not. You'll just you'll know it when the time comes. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Verse 4, who shall not fear your, you, O Lord? Glorify your name. For you alone are holy. For all nations have come and worship before you. You, your judgments have been manifested. God wants you and me standing on that sea of glass. I can't tell you where it is. I can't tell you what it is. I don't care. I just want to be there, right? For that victory celebration. So how will God help us gain the victory? John tells us. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is, and this is where your Bible keeps throwing you in a little curly curve, born and begotten are the same Greek word. You have to decide before you put it into English which one it ought to be. So whatever is born, meaning everyone begotten of God. Once, you, once you're baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, you are now a begotten child of God. Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. John, thank you very much. Our faith. Your faith is so precious, so critically important, so all-encompassing. And sadly, we've got two billion Jesus-following Bible-reading people who have faith. They're going to heaven when they die. And you can talk to them, and you can try and shake it loose. It's not coming loose. They are rock-solid in their faith, believing in their faith that they will go to heaven when they die, and you can't. You can't show them a hundred scriptures to prove it different. They won't listen, right? In Greek, the victory definition there is to gain victory is to subdue, to conquer, to overcome, to prevail, to get the victory, right? So we are victory soldiers for Christ. John says, 1 John 5, 5, Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes, okay, believe means trust in faith. Right? You can believe that the moon is made of green cheese. I hope you don't. You can believe the world is flat. I hope you don't believe that either. Right? Right? And you can people can believe this, that, or the other thing. And now on TV and radio and television and new broadcast, it's hard to know what to believe. You know, even with video, it's like, I think I saw this happen. But that didn't really happen. Something else happened. So trust in faith that Jesus is the Son of God. What's that mean? He's the all powerful creator of the universe if you're going to believe and trust in faith in Jesus you had better pay close attention to the words he says now there are 1.6 billion Muslims on the planet today probably a few more by now who believe in Jesus and that he was a prophet but they will not and they do not and they never will for a long time believe that he is the son of God which means he doesn't get the authority, he doesn't get the respect, he doesn't get, they don't pay close attention to his words, they pay close attention to Muhammad's words, right, and Allah's words, whatever. So if a person truly believes, trusts in, has faith in Jesus, 
as the Son of God Almighty, they must logically believe, trust, have faith in every word Jesus spoke. And they can't have this attitude of, well, that's what it looks like he said, but he didn't mean that. <laughs> no, no, no. If it's in the book, he kept it in the book, and you've got to understand, is it correctly translated, right? Because there could be a begotten or a born thrown in there. Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, Man shall not live by a red alone, we heard this, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which most of us came through the words of Jesus, right? Hebrews 10.38, the just shall live by faith, but everyone who draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, which is God's very gentle, very nice way of saying, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble if you draw back. Greek definition there, persuasion, faith persuasion you right and two billion people are persuaded they're persuaded they have now they have credence and credence goes a little bit to like is it credible right are, are there facts if you go to court i watch a lot of perry mason if you if you go to court and you presumably have facts they better be good facts you can't have you know, make up facts as you go along they have to be facts. credence moral conviction religious truth truthfulness of god right that's rendered assurance to so your faith is assurance in what in going to heaven no in what jesus said you're not going to heaven okay i have faith in that we should have faith in that belief believe faith right these all of these are pretty much the same thing and translated from the same word hebrews 11 1. now faith is here it comes we're going to get the definition the substance well, thank you so much for making it clear. Faith is the substance. Well, that's good news, right? What does he mean by substance? It means the setting under, the support, the assurance. If you build a house down on the beach, right, in Panama City Beach or Alabama Beach or any place near the beach, you go out to the sea and on the edge of the water and you say, I'm going to build my house right here. And you put up poles, right? And and <coughs> you you... You go, okay, I'm going to support my house on these poles because there's going to be a hurricane someday and the tidal surge will be 12 feet and I'll build it 15 feet and the tidal surge can come in under my house and go away and my house will be just fine. The support of what it is that I believe or had confidence or credence in, right? God's Bible promises and proof from history and prophecy and answered prayer. Answered prayer should be our strongest belief in God, right? Now, Rick has, Rick has belief in God because he floated down from, what, 12 feet high in the sky and landed without breaking his neck and breaking his knees or breaking any bone in his body, right? That doesn't normally happen when, you, when you're chainsawing and you get kicked off a ladder by a, a branch and down you come 12 feet and you hit the ground and then the chainsaw thing it's like you i, I got to see this i'm hoping god has a hall of fame of <laughs> of really neat miracles right and i want to see which angel carried that chainsaw from the other side of that tree while rick was being soft landed back here i want to see which angel carried that chainsaw 51 feet in the opposite direction landed it down and kept it idling it's like come on that doesn't happen but that's proof of god right that that doesn't happen anyhow so the rest of that verse the evidence back to the courtroom scene the evidence is this real evidence right what is evident bible is evidence isn't it is it in the Bible? How long have we had the Bible? Oh, they wrote it yesterday. No, they didn't. It's been there for 2,000 years. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls are proof. I love it. Somebody else wrote down a lot of Bible scriptures and put them in caves in big pots, and they stayed there for 2,000 years, and some goat herding kid broke a pot, found them, they've compared them to the Bible, and it's like 99% exactly the same stuff nothing has changed in 2000 years except a comma here and a whatever there you know so okay in your notes there i've given you a heading truth from cluster understanding question can anyone give us a definition for the word cluster what does cluster mean a gathering. 
gathering a bunch of. Um, a group of something, if you look in the dictionary. A group of something, right? Okay, cluster, not custard. Don't mix it up with custard, because custard didn't end well. Isaiah explains, explains to us cluster understanding, right? And almost nobody ever says anything about it, so I, I thought I'd phrase it this way to give us a new, fresh look. Right, Isaiah 28, 9. Who shall he teach knowledge and make to understand the message? 10. The precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You gather the facts, you gather the evidence, you gather the scriptures. Zechariah 14, you gather Matthew 24, you gather Revelation, you start bringing them together, right? A simple example of this is the thief on the cross. Most Bibles change the understanding using a comma. That's all they use, a comma, right? Luke 23, 43, Jesus said, I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. That's how most Bibles read, and that's how most people read it, and that's how most people have faith in the thief on the cross went to paradise the same day with Jesus, because Jesus said so. And billions read this, and they have faith, they have credence from that one verse and that one comment, right? That the thief went to heaven that day, so they have faith that they will go to heaven when they die. And that's it. End of discussion. Using God's line upon line, we see one more verse that makes understanding the whole thing very clear. In that verse, Jesus makes a giant promise. Matthew twelve forty, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish, so... The Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, dead, in the grave, in the tomb. Now, those people that were around him wanted to have a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Right? And Jesus said, no sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. No sign will be given except this one sign of the prophet Jonah. Three days and three nights. And they even bend that to three days and two nights. It's like Jesus doesn't know the difference between two and three. <laughs> so we'll just call it three days and two nights. That's, that'll be good enough for us. No, he's the son of God, the creator of the universe. Pay attention to what he says. I did find a South African Bible that renders this verse correctly. <laughs> oh, somebody got it right. Luke 23, 43. Truly I say to you today, comma, you shall be with me in paradise. And that's the perfect answer, and the comma is now in the right place, although you don't need a comma. If you just ima ima you know, imagine it with no comma, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And all of that is perfectly true, and you can have faith in that, but not in the other one. Faith grows by learning more and more Bible truth. In a few years, the two witnesses will begin preaching the true gospel into all the world. Matthew 24, 14. Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom, of the kingdom. It's the kingdom gospel, right? Now there's kingdom hall. You'll drive past some buildings that will say kingdom hall, right? But they don't have the whole presentation, the seven annual festivals, kingdom of God, right? The gospel of the kingdom should be preached by the Worldwide Church of God. How many of you have faith in that? <laughs> Nobody, good, right? So, right? Shall be preached into all the world as a witness to all nations. How can you do that? Well, Herbert was saying, hey, well, we're gonna do it. You send us money and we'll put Ted on TV and we'll do that, right? But all nations now, with a cell phone, I meant to bring mine with me, but think of your cell phone. Can you watch events? Can you watch, did any of you watch the, uh, the Notre Dame? The cathedral, Notre Dame Cathedral burning? Did anybody, do you see that on your cell phones while it was burning? That was in France, yes, yes. I heard about it. Yeah, okay. You could have, you could have gone to a news thingy and you could have hit a button and seen the video playing of it actually burning while it was burning, right? Global TV is in your cell phone. And, and you know, who's going to confiscate all the cell phones? Not going to happen, 
right? Anyhow, so this gospel as a witness to all nations. And then the end of man's age and the beginning of God's age will come. God wants us to have total faith in the two witnesses so that we will be faithful to God in the end times. Question, has the true gospel message been preached into all nations as a witness? Has it? Do all nations know what the true gospel is? Do any nations do any nations know what the true gospel is? It's not out there, right? It hasn't happened yet. The two witnesses, three and a half years, will do it. But Revelation 11, 3, it shows how this will happen. It says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days, three and a half years. They will speak under inspiration and they will have a prophetic office. For three and a half years, the world will see God's two great leaders and Satan's two great leaders. Now picture this. Two great leaders here and two great leaders here. Now one of them is a prophet. Now he's a false prophet, but he's not wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm the false prophet, right? He's a prophet. He could well be the Pope, the new one, the old one's in a wheelchair, I think. But anyhow, again, it could well be the Pope with a, a million followers in the Roman Catholic Church, right? And then the beast, right? Who's the military guru guy, and he's the one to be worshipped more than the false prophet. Right? And then the two witnesses who are dressed, right, as we'll see, in, in a special way. And we need to know when this happens, you get, you've got, you're going to see a new Bible. What do I mean? These two witnesses will be speaking directly connected to God, to the world, about what the world needs to hear during the next three and a half years. They are going to put down the beast and the mark of the beast. and you know, They're going to tear them up, right? And the beast and the false prophet are going to want to tear up the two witnesses. And God has a plan for that too. So, um, Revelation 19.2, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet uh, who worked signs in, the present, in his presence and by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image and these two were cast alive in the lake of burning and fire and brimstone. So you know what happens to them. These are the two great leaders, right? They're humans, right? And, and, and nobody's going to question whether or not they're humans, although they'll think the beast is Christ, right? That's a little twisted there, but that's what it's going to be. Satan's worship system will be preached side by side with God's true worship system. And you need to know, we will need to know, we know now, right? But the world is going to be shaking and twisting and people and our friends and neighbors and relatives maybe say, why don't you accept the beast, right? As Jesus Christ returned to planet Earth. He sits in the temple of God. He shows himself that he is God. Why won't you believe him? Because I believe Jesus said he would do that ahead of time. And Jesus said, when you do get to see me, I'll be on a white horse coming down in the sky. That's my first sighting on planet Earth. So when many Arab nations are captured and nuclear war happens and the tribulation starts, our heads are going to be spinning with the horror of world catastrophes. It's getting bad by the day. Um, the ex-prime minister of Japan assassinated, right? Um, you know, China hasn't yet taken Taiwan. Every morning, China's thinking, should we or shouldn't we? And they're looking at November the 8th, and they're going, is the sleeping giant going to be awoken? we got to hedge our bets. we got to play this close to the best. And they're seeing that, that uh, Putin is now considered by a lot of people as the 21st century Hitler. And he is not doing well anywhere, right? Even China is backing away from me a little bit. Jesus and the Father are preparing us ahead of time with to 100% follow the two witnesses. Now, when they come on the scene, you should have, based on what you're learning and studying nowadays, when they appear, there should be zero question as to is it these two that are God's two witnesses? Or is it these two that are God's two witnesses? Now, it's easy right now. It's like, 
Oh, that's a piece of cake. Yeah, but when everybody in the world says the false prophet and the beast are Christ, and only you in your neighborhood say, uh -uh, it's like, hmm, that's going to be a heavy load to carry, right? Verse Revelation 14, 9. The third angel said with a loud voice, if anyone who worships the beast or his image or receives the mark in his forehead and his hand, right? Um, <clears throat> these two verses are worthy of memorizing, right? Because this is God saying, um, just in case during the, during the tribulation, you are tempted to think that the false Christ is the real Christ. Let me give you a little insight, right? If anyone worships the image or receives the mark in the forehand and so on, right? Verse 10, he himself, she herself will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Oh, but I was a church member of God. Yeah, but you took the mark of the beast. All bets are off. You get to suffer the torment. They'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb. Well, that's not fair, God. I was a church member 20, 40, 60 years. <laughs> yeah, but you made a mistake. You had faith in the wrong two people. When a hurricane is bearing down on Galveston, people make every preparation possible for the onslaught of weather. Right? God wants us to have three verses super clear in our minds now while it's just very hot, right? But it's not tribulation time yet because we haven't quite made it that far. Revelation 11, 3, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 6 are all really good to have memorized. And I will give power to my two witnesses, so there will be two witnesses. They will prophesy for you know, three, three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. So how do you suppose the beast and the false prophet will dress? How does the Pope dress right now? Right? And if, if the beast sits in the temple of God and shows himself that he is God, is he going to dress pretty fine? You know? Okay. And, and who's going to believe two guys dressed in sackcloth? Really? You can tell by their tailor. They are not of God, right? Verse 5. If anyone wants to harm them, there's a clincher, fire proceeds from their mouth, try to picture this, and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. Can you close your eyes and picture fire from their mouth? It's like having a flamethrower just inside your dental work, right? It's like, and, and is that going to be a good representation of how God deals with people? Just flame throw them to death, flame throw them to death, flame throw them to death. Now they get a lot of respect that way, right? Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven so that it doesn't rain, right? Not too many people can do that, right? In the days of their prophecy, they have power over the waters to turn them to blood, Right? Shades of Moses, shades of the miracles of the past, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Right? So this is going to be heavy affliction on the people of planet earth. Right? As God has done. This is God's way of, of knocking you up the side of the head and saying you better pay attention. Right? Okay, knowing these three verses and having solid faith in the two witnesses before they appear will keep us from buying, being deceived along with the, the crowd. We all have this tendency of want to be accepted by the crowd, by our relatives, you know, by other Bible reading people, right? So verse 9, Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. This is his greatest deception, right? He's done some pretty nifty deceiving in the past. He is going to fake the beast, that's why God calls him the beast, right? Beastly person, beastly Hitler-like person, right? Only Satan will be calling him Christ, right? And most of the world will believe it. To set up a fake Jesus look-alike. You've seen Elvis look-alikes, right? Or is that really Elvis? Is Elvis still alive, maybe? Right? Okay. Who and, and this fake look-alike will rule the world for three and a half years during the tribulation period. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. 
That doesn't even sound like Jesus, does it? It's like he did, he was plain, plain spoken, but he's not. Well, I am superior, right? Okay, call God and his worship, and he sits as God in the temple of God, in the shrine, in the holy area, right? Showing himself that he is God, and people will believe that he is God. And the false prophet will call down fire from heaven and show, and there'll be miracles, and people will go, yeah, yeah, this is God, Jesus is on earth. We're going to have a thousand years of peace, the millennium. Oh, it's going to be so great. Revelation 13, 4. So they worshiped the dragon and gave, who gave authority to the beast? This is... This is a satanic-driven leader. Hitler was involved with Satan, but, but Satan has given permission to go whole hog here two or three and a half years and to mess with people's minds beyond their comprehension, except God's mapped it all out first. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with the beast? Revelation 13, 5, And it was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, What's a blasphemy? Saying things about God that just ain't so. It's error, right? And he was given authority to blast for 42 months, three and a half years. Verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, which we should be able to recognize, but most people can't. Right now, they can't recognize blasphemy against God, right? Sunday worship is blasphemy against God, right? So, and, okay, the world will accept this Hitler-like beast person as Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 24, 23. If, they, if anyone says, look, here is the Christ, or there, over there, is the Christ. Jesus says to you and to me and to anybody who wants to pay attention to the words of the Son of God, right, don't believe it, right? We must have faith now, that this is going to happen. People will be telling us, oh, Christ is over there, or he's in hidden place, or he's here. Matthew 24, 25. See, I had told you ahead of time so that you can believe and have faith that the fake Christ is coming to look like the real Christ. Verse 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, words from Jesus, don't go out. Now, now, what harm could it do? What harm could it do to just go and have a look? I mean, you're not, I'm, I'm not going to believe it. I, I just want to go and see what it looks like. Don't go. You'll be tempted. Don't go. And don't look, right? And the cell phones will be lit up and the TV screens will be lit up. He is, and he's in inner rooms. He's in hiding. He's over here. He's over there, right? Do not Believe it. Why? Because I, Jesus, told you, A, this is coming, and B, that I'm coming on a white horse in the sky. Stay the course. Be faithful unto death no matter what happens. Jesus and the Father have given us many scriptures to be fully prepared and full of faith. As John said, our faith will bring us the victory. All right, Whatever is begotten of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. God is eager for us to be there on the sea of glass singing the victory song of the Lamb.